Uh, all right, oh, we live. Let me share this. Get this out there. Un momento. This on. Mm -hmm. Just sharing this, folks. Just one moment, almost done, Just sharing this, all right, inna alhamdulillahi wa kafa, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-mustafa, wa ala ibadihi al-lazhi nartada, wa man bihudahu mihtada, wa bi athar ahli al-madina tiqtafa, wa ba'd, فسلام الله على القوم أهلا وسهلا بكم مرحبا حنين لايت بخير راغلي خوش آمديد and of course سواقتم people سواقتم alright أهلا وسهلا بكم alright people Momo is in the house is that you Momo is that you though is that you <laughs> Sid alright doing it doing it Right, everything is well. Yep, everything is well. Lillahi alhamd. Lillahi alhamd. Belgium won. Okay, I don't watch any football. So I've got no idea. <laughs> the only way I, I, I hear anything about football is I see some of the memes. <laughs> Alright, so people, what's going down? What's going down, man? As you can see, my... Alright... It's coming along. You see, <laughs> the only place ever where hair grows slowly for some reason for me is here. <laughs> Other than that, the Pakistani jeans are like in overflow everywhere else. But here, this... <laughs> right, so people, what's going on? Hamad, ahlan wa sahlan bikum, ahlan wa sahlan. Those of you just tuning in, click like, click share, people. Somebody's saying that it makes me look bright with Noor. <laughs> of course, Noor to hai baba. <laughs> noor to hai, Noori Noor. Sarapa Noor, that's what. Noorun ala Noor. Yahdillahu li noorihi man yasha. Allah. For I am the light and none shall reach the Father except through me. <laughs> oh, sorry, wrong religion. <laughs> Getting carried away. That's uh, today's Monday. Yeah, it's uh, that's wrong religion. <laughs> right. So, all right. Elizabeth Ahlan wa Sahlan is wearing Nike Haram. <laughs> you know, from some of the ridiculous stuff you see in the in in the Muslim kind of, I don't know how to say it, the Muslim, the Muslim scene, so to speak. It's the kind of Muslim scene, right? So, ridiculous stuff, seriously. <laughs> Is Nike haram? <laughs> They're Nike. I, somebody sent me a link to that. I, I still haven't watched it, actually. I clicked on it and then I thought, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> I, thought, I thought, seriously, let's get back to that TV series. I mean... <laughs> Right, so, Salam Mufti, I graduate tomorrow. Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. Mu'adh is in the house. All right, Mu'adh, you're doing it, you're doing it. Those of you just tuning in, click like, click share, people. Get this out there. Right, yeah, so some people are trying to say, well, Nike is haram, and this is haram, and that is haram. And people are so trigger happy with the term haram. It's like, haram, haram, haram. <laughs> Haram! It's like Stallone. 
<laughs> so, well, so, right, Sagatam, yep, Swagatam, Swagatam. Did you see Ali Dawa call Majid Nawaz and call him a kafir? I did see that. Abu Laith, I will send you a watch. Hi, 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 hi. You trying to, you nutty nutty, try, trying to kill me with kindness? <laughs> As the poet says, that tabah karne ke or bhi kai raaste te faraz. That to destroy me, there were many other ways as well, Faraz. Na jane unhe kyun mohabbat ka hi khayal aya. That why is it that they, the only way they thought was through love. <laughs> yeah, salam. Shukran, shukran for your kindness and courtesy. No, send me your address. Ah, nutty nutty. <laughs> What if <laughs> you're trying to turn up? <laughs> At least turn up with a. <laughs> you gotta make a date first. We can't just turn up. <laughs> I mean. So, all right, people, what's going down? The weather, god damn. What do you think of Imam Tawhidi? Tawhidi, as opposed to Imam Shirki. <laughs> <laughs> Imam Tawhidi. I've, you know, I've, I've seen a few things of Imam Tawhidi. It's interesting because I've, I've seen some suggestions. You know, you click on one thing and you watch it and then YouTube gives you all these suggestions. <laughs> YouTube, artificial intelligence, right? So it's, it's shown me a few things and I've, I've watched a few things. To be fair, in some of the things, you know, credit where credit is due, he's, speaking a lot of sense, speaking about the deen being one of compassion, that the message of Islam has become uh, overly distorted, um, that Islam has kind of got hijacked. I, I agree with all those things that he's saying there in some of those clips I've seen. I have seen some other clips of his where he's really provocative. I don't know if they're out of context or they're old or, I don't know how out of context they could be, but where he's saying some really disrespectful things about Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an and stuff like this. And I find that very um, highly irresponsible. I mean, obviously, as a Muslim, Sunni Muslim, I find it utterly unacceptable, but I also find his actions, if that is what he's... Uh, provided those clips were legitimate, I mean, they weren't kind of dubbed or something like this. I have seen some where he's saying all kinds of things about Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an and stuff like this. And I think that is, uh, if that be true, then that's highly irresponsible. Okay. Um, that's that Imam Tawhidi. Because I really think that there needs to be bridges built between... Uh, the the Sunni mainstream main Muslims in general and uh, between the Shia community, I think we really need to kind of bridge gaps and we need to kind of at least just learn to kind of get on. Um, and I think there is no solution. If I'm going to be honest, there is no solution to these uh, to these kind of differences that the Sunni and Shia have. I don't think there's any solution to them, but except for the fact that we just don't discuss them amongst between ourselves so and we refrain from abuse now if that can happen i believe bridges can definitely be built and i believe it's important to to build these bridges because you know most muslims that grow up muslim they don't really understand what is sunni what is shia what is these kind of things and and then there's just like a hatred and there's like a lot of cussing, a lot of dissing. And I just feel that that's not the way forward. That's all. I feel that, you know, really to me as a person, I'm going to be honest, me as a person, uh, I, I feel that I obviously, uh, I mean, I've been very vocal about it in the past. I ha have a huge, the utmost respect 
for uh, the, the wives of the Prophet, the companions and all these people. Uh, I do accept, like everybody else, that nobody's infallible. However, uh, I, I wouldn't be really too critical of the companions like that. Not in on a personality scale like that. I know sometimes when we're discussing hadith and we've said that some of the scholars in the past, like the Hanafi Madhab and other people, they divided the Sahaba, the companions, as those who were like true, like, I don't know if true is the better word, but the core companions, as in those who actually spent time with the Prophet, participated in expeditions and did things, and those who maybe just saw him. And then some divided them as uh, people who were learned companions uh, and scholars and those who were just, uh, I mean, they were companions, but they weren't known as the most learned amongst them. Like, for, And this is where the debate on Abu Huraira radiallahu anh comes, because the Hanafi Madhab uh, highly, I mean, it me mentioned in the early Usul books, as did some other scholars, that Abu Huraira was not from the kind of the scholar companions, and therefore you have to be weary when he's transmitting certain things, because it may be by meaning, and the meaning may have got, and even after him, it may have got kind of shuffled up. So things like this are different, but to cate to criticize their personality, I think um, you got to be weary because it's a very sensitive topic. Um, so I, I completely, I would just say leave that alone. Um, and I know that to me, that if you're going to criticize them, you see, this is the, the weary thing that you see, because last year there was this whole thing where people were criticizing. And I said, well, if you're going to criticize them, why don't you, if you want to be objectively critical, then you would apply the same critical lens to even Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh. Why only to Muawiyah or Umar? Or why not to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh? And, and I mentioned last year a lot of the scholars who held that stance, including Imam Malik, who was was critical of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh. In a in a in an objective way, he was critical. He wasn't never had no hatred or anything. Obviously, he loved Sayyidina Ali, but he was critical of him in saying that Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh did pursue did pursue power. And therefore, he saw that kind of kind of paved the way for some of his judgments. Now, and then a lot of people got annoyed when I quoted that and it's triggered off a storm and, and it did all of this last year. And, and to me, really, obviously, then I dealt with it. But in hindsight now, you know, having moved on almost a year, <laughs> a year older, I think like these things, like to me as a person, do they really matter? Like, I mean, I like history, whatever's happened has happened. Like, I don't know us talking about it. It's different. Yeah, we can talk about it, but we can't change it. Whatever's happened has happened. And we need to really focus on the present and we need to focus on how to move forward and how to have bridges between us, the, the Shia, the Sunni, um, and I say Sunni by a very wide, I'll include, <laughs> include our Wahhabi brethren in that as well. All of us Sunni, as in the mainstream, because Sunni as well is a huge spectrum. What does Sunni mean? I mean, nobody truly knows what Sunni means, by the way. <laughs> it's such a, it's such a blag, isn't it? <laughs> what is Sunni? I mean... <laughs> When did this term start actually emerge, Ahl Sunnah? It's amazing because the Salaf never used this term. They never said, by the way, we are Ahl Sunnah. <laughs> this comes much after the Salaf. Um, and then it's amazing because, but anyway, today it exists. Uh, Sunni orthodoxy, orthodoxy, <laughs> right? So main street, but the point is we need to move forward. So that was uh, an answer stemming from what are my views on people like Imam Tawhidi. I don't know him. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know him at all, really, not on any personal. I've seen some videos, some videos I've seen very decent kind of things being said by him. In some videos, I've seen very provocative, irresponsible things being said. So I don't I don't know, but I don't know him that well. I've never really paid too much attention to his thing. Right. So. Differences aren't.
right? Yeah, I don't, I don't actually feel that the differences, honestly, between Sunni and Shia are so huge. I think it's just a historical perspective, that's all, on politics, on leadership and stuff like that. That's it. Because, you know, all these other things, like I watched this debate, uh, a Shia uh, friend, he sent me a link to a discussion of his uh, with a, a Sunni at Speaker's Corner. Speaker's, whatever they call it, Speaker's Corner, Hyde Park, whatever. So they were, I watched not all of it, but I watched some of it and they were speaking and in between they were talking about Sunni, Shia kind of differences and, and they kept bringing up Mut'a, Mut'a, you know, this temporary marriage and... Uh, <laughs> and obviously, in all honesty, if we're going to be fair, the Sunnis are unfair on this matter. If we're going to be, if we're going to be objective, that they're unfair in slating the Shia on muta'a, uh, temporary marriage, because really muta'a is to do with fiqh, is to do with how we practice, uh, like the laws of Islam, which is nothing to do with beliefs. So muta'a is simply having a temporary marriage. Now. Whether you accept it or don't accept it is a matter of fiqh. It's not actually a matter of iman. And for some reason, we've made it a matter of iman. And what the hell has it got to do with iman? And there's been many sahaba who allowed uh, muta'a coming right down to the likes of scholars like Ibn Ashur from you know the great Maliki legend. Uh, people like this, they allowed muta'a. It wasn't... And today, the Sunnis have this equivalent, which in slang terms is called Nikah al Misyar, which is like a, a low commitment uh, kind of marriage where it's just a, <laughs> what I call one of Eric Erickson's stages in psychology and development, which he says, low commitment, high exploration. <laughs> so these are like, and the Sunnis, I think really. To be honest with you, if if they open, if if the Sunni scholars weren't that critical of muta, let's be honest, they would be on it like <laughs> they would be madly on muta. If we're just going to be honest, because all the Muslim circles seem to be discussing all the time is just marriage, 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 like massively depra deprived, undepraved. <laughs> so. Let's just face it, that, you know, so why are you bashing the Shia and Muta'a? That's just a, I, I just find, is it just a point of jealousy? <laughs> anyway, let's move on, let's move on. All right, so what's going on? Right, I, I've done a bit of shopping, people, some book shopping. You can't really see my books here, but loads. I, you know, I spoke last week about Sahil Bukhari and this research that I've been doing for a little while now. Somebody said muta is fun though. I kind of wish Sunnis believed in it too. Believe. <laughs> believe. Of course we <laughs> Of course we are people of belief. <laughs> on that note, there is a uh, people who are interested in research on the topic of muta. There is a recent Maliki scholar from Morocco who's published a whole uh, book after his research, which I, I think it was his thesis, but uh, his research is called Zawaj al-Mut'a, Kira'atun Jadida fil Fikri Sunni, uh, which means that uh, Mut'a marriage, like temporary marriage, a revisiting based on Sunni thought. And it's really interesting because he argues in this book that muta is not actually haram, uh, but only through Sunni sources. And it's really fascinating, his kind of whole... Um, and he has a debate with Sheikh, um, with the Salafi Sheikh, it's on YouTube. His name is Ibn al-Azraq, uh, this doctor. And he debates in Morocco, uh, he's Moroccan and he debates another Moroccan Salafi, so he's Maliki, he debates a Salafi by... The, a popular da'i, Salafi da'i, by the name of Sheikh Fazazi. And he's debating him. And it's so, the debate was so dumb, some of it. You know, it's like the usual kind of responses, which I found very immature, like, uh, uh, you know, okay, if you think muta is okay, then marry your daughter to me now. I'll do muta with her. I thought, well, that's like very rude. Like, what the hell is, is that about? 
<laughs> what the hell is that about? <laughs> like, how could you, I mean, seriously, could you imagine two academic kind of like professors, like let's say in Oxford or Cambridge, having a debate like this? Is this how, what a dumb, what a stupid thing to say. Like, oh, so you think it's halal to have a temporary, okay, then give, marry your daughter to me as a temporary marriage. And then that guy says something like, uh, get lost. I would never marry my daughter to you, even if he came asking. And and then he, this Sheikh Fazazi says, well, I wouldn't want to marry your daughter because uh, she's going to be ugly like you. I thought, and this is on YouTube. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> this is like a debate between, uh, I thought, this is just, wow, this is amazing, man. Like how dumb <laughs> people are. Anyway, moving on. So people last week, as I was mentioning, I was doing some, I'm doing research for a little while now on this whole Sahih al-Bukhari and can we, uh, how certain can we be that the book Sahih al-Bukhari with all its content, is the work of Imam Bukhari himself. The entire content, not just like most of it or some of it, but the entire content we have today. How certain can we be that that is, that is the Imam's work himself? So there seems to be, uh, it seems to be quite, uh, you know, it's, it seems to be not as clear as uh, I once thought or many people believe it to be. So, and I was mentioning last week, there is a book. So this is the book. This is one book, people, that uh, it's been, it's published by a Moroccan, I mean, it's the author is a Moroccan uh, kind of researcher. His name is uh, Rashid Eilal, and he published this book. This is one book, I mean, in the whole discourse called Sahil Bukhari Nihayat Ustura, the Sahil Bukhari, the end of a fairy tale. And this was published last year in Morocco. And then what happened is the Salafis kind of made a big hoo-ha and they said, well, you know, burn the book. And they got the local magistrate involved who then prohibited any further publishing of it. So there were very few copies left. So I contacted the publisher. Alhamdulillah, he had a few copies. So why not? So we flew over, me and Sheikh al because <laughs> that's how we roll, and thought, let's pick it up and do a bit of book shopping whilst we're there. So, so I've brought back some interesting books. This is one. This is a fascinating book. Um, right. So it's about Sahil Bukhari. He's gone through a lot of research into show uh, one of the criticisms that were uh, pointed towards Bukhari, some really blasphemous hadith that are in Sahil Bukhari, but also a lot of work on the kind of manuscripts that are available. Uh, so, for example, uh, most of the copies, if not all the copies in uh, um, in, 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 in Saudi, in, Mal in Jami'ah, uh, this is Malik Abdul Aziz. So in that university, he I believe he goes, he has access to and he does research there and he kind of includes all the manuscripts and shows how these manuscripts are problematic because they're not as abundant. So he has an entire kind of list of all the, goes on, spans several pages, the, this, uh, all the kind of manuscripts, what century they were written in. So you tend to find that the earliest complete copy of Sahil Bukhari emerges about 200 years after Imam Bukhari, as in that's the oldest copy we have today. It's about 200 years after him. Um, and there's a lot of issues with his students because this stems from the factor that Imam Bukhari, as I highlighted last week, he, during the last few years of his life, was blacklisted. So nobody would take hadith from him or very few people would dare take hadith from him. So he became very toxic and radioactive by no fault of his own. He was an amazing person, but sectarianism kind of uh, dropped him in it. And so people kind of banned taking hadith from him. This complicates the problem further. So the students that took Bukhari from him, none of their copies are found. I mean, none of they, their copies do not go on, most of the reliable students, except one student whose name is Farabri, and he has no, like he's a bit, none of the hadith scholars of his age, 
comment about him. Like he's not really known amongst them. Now his students take Bukhari from him, but they openly say that his copy was incomplete. And we used to move hadith around, we would chain chapter headings, we would do stuff. And they all have their own variations on this. So it's interesting that whole, uh, so I went, I, I got hold of this book to add to my research. So inshallah, there'll be a lot more uh, coming on that in, in the future. Uh, whilst I was there, there were some interesting books. I'll share some of them with you. Uh, this is a really fascinating book. It's uh, once again written, uh, it's published in Morocco. It's a kind of, uh, it's a collection of a, a lot of different, I don't know if articles is the right word, but uh, small booklets, if you like, dedicated to topics that are, that are controversial. Uh, but I love the title. Uh, and it's dedicated, that's one of the discussions involved. As you can see, Ummi Kamilatu Aqlin wa Deen. That my mother, a complete woman of Aql, of intellect and Deen. And that's obviously said provocatively for the alleged Hadith, which I don't believe to be a Sahih Hadith, which is a Hadith that says that women are Naqisatu Aql wa Deen, that they lack Aql and lack Deen. So this is uh, a part of this article was, uh, or this booklet in amongst these kind of collection of uh, uh, responses is that my mother, a woman complete in both intellect and Deen. And it kind of goes on to um, shed his light on why this hadith is utterly unreliable. And I find that amazing. Uh, so that's something to inshallah, you'll be hearing more of in uh, in the days to come this was a little interesting book i picked up on the tartib how the quran has been organized i thought well um in terms of revelation and then the way it's been put together some journals on aqida this once again it's from that same publisher to do with uh, that was speaking about my mother who is a complete woman in uh, faith and intellect this is another interesting book called Adhan al-An'am that the ears of um, of livestock and and what it is is it's a kind of study into evolution and how that is uh, I believe how that is compatible uh, with Islam so that was a quite an interesting I've got to inshallah take a look at this but I tell you something a quick glance at this made me think about there's a verse that he brings to our attention at some point um, as I was glancing through this um, the verse of the Quran that alam yati ala al insani hina min al dahar that has there not come upon insan a portion of time lam yakun shay'an madhkura that he was not a mentioned thing now it's interesting that everybody that people generally translate that or interpret that to refer to um, that we were dead, that we did not exist. Dead, sorry, not a, a good translation, but we were non-existent. That, uh, and then we were brought into existence. But it's interesting that the way this author sheds light on that verse, and it seems to make more sense, that alam yati al insani, wouldn't it be then said differently? Like maybe something like alam yamar, that has time not passed, when insan, you know, lam yakun shay'an madhkura, when insan was not. But it says, alam yati ala linsani hinum min ad-dahar. That a time of age. Did that time from age, from as in time as a whole, not pass over insan whilst he was not a thing to be mentioned? But that is interesting upon reflection because it should have been the whole of the, the as in age, the whole time with a capital T, has passed and insan did not exist. Unless, why did it say a portion of time passed when he was not a thing to be mentioned? Was it because that insan was still evolving? That's interesting. And at that stage, insan was not a thing to be mentioned. That is a very interesting kind of uh, angle and something to be looked into. So here's another uh, a book I picked up, people. This right in front of us is uh, Abu Suleiman al-Hafid al-Khattabi's 
a, a brief commentary on the summary of Bukhari. The reason I got this is because people, because his, he's a very early scholar uh, who passes away in 388 Hijri. And he took Bukhari from one of the students of Imam Bukhari. Uh, sorry, his teacher took it from one of the students whose transmission is lost shortly after. Although this is an incomplete, it's only a summary, but it's, it's just to kind of show, well, in case people argue that it is still found in its earlier transmissions. It isn't because this is incomplete. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of summarized version, but it's interesting to see how he highlights differences as well. So I bought that. Uh, what else? I've got so many here, but I, I won't really go through all of these because it's just going to take forever. This is an interesting book being brought into print. It's the Mukhtasar of Abu Mus'ab al-Zuhri, who's a student of Imam Malik from Medina. So I thought, all right, in fiqh, why not, people, why not? Uh, the tafsir, I picked this up. I never really had this before. Tafsir of uh, Sheikh Rashid Rida, uh, Tafsir al-Manar, who is a student of Muhammad Abdul. Um, I thought, well, that will be an awesome addition to my addition to my library so why not i put that there um once again ilalul hadith by ali uh, ibn al-madini something in uh, what i've called ilalul hadith as textual pathology people textual pathology so when you're looking at hidden kind of pathogens allah copywriting these terms right there people right narratorial pathogens that's what i'm talking about but there was an interesting thing that uh, I was looking at this hadith in here. There's a discussion on Al-Hasan and has he heard from the companion Abu Bakr? And there was an interesting discussion in this book because although people like Ali ibn al-Madini said he had and Bukhari said he had, but scholars like Yahya ibn Ma'in said he never heard from Abu Bakr and including Dar Qutni who criticizes and says even though Bukhari has a narration from him saying he heard from Abu, Bak uh, from Abu Bakr a companion uh, where the Prophet, the famous hadith where the Prophet says to him when he hastens to pray that don't hasten next like as in Zadakallah hirsan may Allah increase you in ambition but don't uh, don't do that again like don't come running come calmly to the prayer uh, but what's interesting is how they quote here, people like Abu walid al-Baji, the Maliki scholar, says that the Hassan in that hadith may actually be Hassan ibn Ali, uh, the son of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an. So they're not even sure which Hassan it is. But what makes that more interesting is this is the same chain that is used for the hadith, that لَنْ يُفْلِحَ قَوْمٌ that such a people will never be successful who make their leader a woman. And that is the same Hassan from Abu Bakr. So the discussion is, has he even ever heard from Abu Bakr? And there's a lot of debate in that. Right, people, I'll tell you what, no point going through any more of these. It's going to take forever. Let's, let's take some of these questions. What's going down? What's going down, people? What's going down? Limited. What does that mean? Limited. Ooh, all right. Right. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> There's questions that have already been submitted. <laughs> Why don't I look at them? One hadith dislike drinking water. First thing, getting up, can you shed light? I'm not sure what that hadith uh, is where the Prophet dislike drinking water. First thing. But any of these kind of hadith, by the way, are more uh, to do with hygiene and etiquettes of like health and stuff like this. They're not. Uh, they're not about halal haram. Allah mentions in the Quran that He will not belittle any of His messengers. Sahih hadith would state otherwise. Yeah, there is a hadith in Sahih al Bukhari. Um, and it's in uh, Sahih Muslim as well about Moses uh, السلام, and basically it's a very disrespectful hadith which is blasphemous uh, but unfortunately 
many Muslims have been kind of fooled by and they feel that it's an authentic narration just because it happens to be in Bukhari um, and the hadith basically states that why it's to do with the Israelites and how they would all kind of bathe together and they would um, and Moses alayhi salam would bathe separately so they used to discuss amongst themselves why does Moses not bathe with us like why doesn't he uh, lie in here uh, uh, as in um, in this kind of water, wherever they were with us so they had this understanding that they used the term in the hadith that he ha was adar which means that his testicles were swollen and they use this they say oh that's the reason he's embarrassed and so the hadith goes on to say that so when Moses came out one day alayhi salam he put his he had his clothes on this rock and he went to get his clothes and the rock started running and then Moses is running after the rock and the rock is running and he's running naked and in Sahih Muslim as well it mentioned so they all looked at his genitals and said oh well mm, you know his testicles seem quite normal and, and this is ridiculous this is such a ridiculous statement uh, this whole hadith is fabricated um, these are just stories from the Israelites that have crept into Islam and uh, you know and Muslims have kind of endorsed them along the way so that's one of them you'll find other sometimes preposterous narrations that hadith is very blasphemous against prophets because Allah says about Musa alayhi salam that he was wajihan he was waji like he was an honorable person Allah had kept him an honorable person not like this and you know rocks running around with your clothes and then Moses beats up the rock as though the rock is an intelligent thing he's beating it up yeah, crazy crazy stories that people believe uh, disrespecting our prophets disrespectful so yeah so that's and you get other stories by the way like another very popular let me tell you another very popular fabricated or mistransmitted hadith in Sahih Bukhari which is this one about Abu Huraira radiallahu and caught the devil and the devil taught him something ridiculous totally ridiculous I mean it completely contradicts the Quran and Sunnah and it disrespects Islam because let's just take a look at this hadith there's a hadith in Sahil Bukhari that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Abu Huraira that you had that he had the wealth of zakat which was to be distributed so this is the wealth of the Muslims it's like Baytul Mal is part of that so it's a like the Muslim Treasury and he asked Abu Huraira to be uh, uh, a stand guard over it like have like night duty on it so Abu Huraira says that whilst I was doing that a man came and he stole from this and he steals something so Abu Huraira catches him and he makes up some story about how his family are suffering and how they're really poor or and things like this and they're really suffering so Abu Huraira decides to let him have it first of all that is bang out of order because it's not up to Abu Huraira to, to, to kind of dispense of the wealth from national treasury of the Muslims just because he feels so he couldn't this this is right but let alone put that side put that aside so he lets him have it so the next day he comes to the Prophet and the Prophet says yeah Abu Huraira did something happen last night and he says yes there was a man now that you mentioned it, there was a man that came and he tried to steal and I caught him and and he said his family was suffering so I gave it to him and the Prophet says to him ah oh, he's a liar this check this out he's a liar Kathib was a Yaud and watch he's gonna come back and lo and behold he comes back this that night so he comes again he steals again and Abu Huraira catches him again and then he tells Abu Huraira the same story that oh my family I'm poor I'm a poor person my family and Abu Huraira again lets him take it like look at this so not only is he letting him take money for the second time or not money but things food or whatever it is but it's not Abu Huraira's to give but the Prophet has declared that that person is a liar yet Abu Huraira still 
disregarding, let's say, what the Prophet is saying. And the Prophet has forewarned that watch he'll come back again. And he does come back again. And Abu Huraira falls for it again. He gets duped again. Like, look how stupid this narration is. And then he comes the next day, the Prophet asks Abu Huraira, hey, did something happen? And he says, yeah, actually, you know, he came again. You were right. And he told me again. And, and I believed him again and I gave him again. And then Abu Hur the Prophet says, he's a liar. Watch, he will come back again. <laughs> this is in Sahil Bukhari, by the way. So, and lo and behold, people, he comes back again. Our, <laughs> the thief, our <laughs> addictive thief, he's on it. The pathological thief, he's back again. And he comes to steal. And this time, Abu Huraira catches him again. And he says, oh, he says, oh, listen, let me go, let me go. And he says, no, I'm not going to let you go this time. And he says, okay, listen, listen, listen. Okay, check this. He says, okay, okay, listen. I'll tell you what. If you let me go, I will teach you something about your religion that you don't know. <laughs> I mean, first of all, just look at this offer. So let me get this right. This guy, who is a thief, who the Prophet has said is a liar, and the Prophet told you, yet you have once again, you, you know, you've fallen for his thing again. The Prophet said it again. You've fallen for it again. Now this thief has come and he's saying to you, you're a companion of the Prophet. You've got access to the Prophet. But he's saying, I will teach you about your religion. So Abu Huraira says, oh, okay, go on then teach me. And he says, you know, when you go to sleep, read Ayatul Kursi and, and he teaches him something about Ayatul Kursi. And then Abu Huraira says, okay, and lets him go. <laughs> so we've got a repetitive kleptomaniac and a, a thief who's just non-stop thieving from the Muslim treasury. Abu Huraira is allegedly in this hadith constantly falling for it. Like he's that, he's being duped constantly. And then on the final occasion, he's saying, uh, you know, oh, you're going to teach me about my religion. Oh, that's awesome. What is it that you're going to teach me? And he teaches him something about uh, Ayat al-Kursi, about before you go to sleep and read this. And then Abu Huraira comes to the Prophet and the Prophet says, hey, did something happen again? And he says, yes. He says, actually, he came and this time I caught him. And then he said he's going to, he offered to teach me something about the religion. The Prophet said, oh, really? What did he say? And he said, he said this about Ayat al-Kursi. And the Prophet said, you know what? That was the devil. However, he told the truth on this occasion. I mean, how blasphemous is this hadith? Seriously. Let me get this right. What did Imam Malik say? Imam Malik said that there is nothing about this deen except the Prophet has taught us. Nothing about this deen except the Prophet has taught it to us. As in, there is no path to Jannah like worship and du'as and things like this that are set except the Prophet taught us. But here we need the devil the devil people to come and teach us about Islam. Right. And the prophet ain't teaching them. The prophet's saying, oh, oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. By the way. Yeah, that's correct. I haven't taught it to you, by the way. But the devil's mentioned it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got that right. What? How blasphemous, disrespectful is this hadith? It shows Abu Huraira to be incredibly clumsy. It shows Abu Huraira to disobey the prophet. It shows the Prophet to have not taught the people this, this, uh, this du'a. Rather, it ne we needed the devil to come and teach us. Wow, it teaches the fact that somebody is thieving from the national treasury and the Prophet is letting it happen. Uh, it teaches the fact that the companion doesn't seem to be so fussed. He's falling for it every night. It's a mockery, mockery, people. Or as some Mulvis would say, mockery. <laughs> <laughs> makri, this is a makri of the deen, you know. <laughs> so the, 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 this, this is the kind of sometimes nonsense that has crept into our tradition. So we have to, this is why be weary that these things go against the Quran, they go against the Sunnah, they go against our teaching of fiqh, they go against like things like Imam Malik has highlighted, that the Prophet taught us that all access, all rituals of this deen were taught to us by the prophet okay we don't need the devil to come and teach us 
<laughs> those of you, those of them that want the devil to be their teacher, they're more than welcome. <laughs> right, so let's move on. Speaking of that, people, there's a, <laughs> there was a meme that was going around. So I put it on Snapchat where there's an interview uh, between an interviewer and an in interviewee. So it's about the devil. <laughs> Sorry, it's about the Dajjal. It's about the Dajjal. So the interviewer in this meme, I, I didn't make the meme, by the way. People thought I made the meme, right? <clears throat> uh, you're forgetting special ops and how governments do test their own. Behave. <laughs> the prophet wasn't doing a special ops. <laughs> right, so uh, in this hadith, uh, sorry, in this meme, the interviewer is asking, so he says, oh, so you're the Dajjal. And he says, yeah. And he says, you claim to be a god. And he says, yes. He says, so what are your capabilities? And he says, you know, I can bring the dead back to life. I can make it rain. I can gather armies. I can do all this kind of stuff. Miraculous stuff. So the interviewer says, so how come you haven't fixed your eye then? <laughs> and, and he says, oh, I never thought about that. That's a good question, by the way. So... So I, I put this on Snapchat. Some people got offended. They said, Oh, why do you, oh, why you mock the Dajjal for? Why you mock the Dajjal in it? Mock the Dajjal. So I was like, Dajjal kya tumara cha cha lagta hai? <laughs> is the Dajjal your, your <laughs> who is he of yours? <laughs> why, why are you so offended? <laughs> the the jail is getting mocked. People get so offended. This one person messaged me and he said, he said, oh, brother, why are you mocking the Dajjal? I was like, is he your cha-cha or something? I'm, I'm, why am I mocking the Dajjal? He goes, oh, it's a valid difference of opinion. I said, what? I can't mock him. I'll mock the Dajjal all I want. Why can't I mock him? Why is he a good person? <laughs> so, you know what's interesting is I asked this person, I said, look, I said, well, what, what makes you think all differences are always valid and respectable? I obviously don't believe in the Dajjal. Those people who do believe in him, fine, that's their choice. But I never made that meme anyway. But yes, I find it funny. And if you want to mock the Dajjal, even if he exists, you can mock him. There's nothing special about the Dajjal. He's not a saint, you know. He's a, <laughs> this, this obviously to me is a mythical character that came in from Christianity, but to other people who want to accept him, uh, he's still, he's not, a, he's not a good guy. <laughs> you can, you can mock him. It's not. <laughs> and the interesting thing is I said, well, do you get as equally worked up about those hadith that are blasphemous towards our prophet? And the person said, I do. I said, what about these hadith like in Bukhari and Muslim that claim that our prophet had sexual relationships with a child? Do you, do, do, do you not get offended by this? And it's amazing how like this goes to show, you know, like these people, like they said, oh, I believe that's a respectable difference of opinion. I honestly, I, I, I lost my, <laughs> I just totally lost it. I immediately blocked that person. Anybody that tells me that's a respectable position, I honestly, I do not want to hear that. Right. So because people like that, to me, have betrayed Allah and his messenger. So so these kind of things, any, anybody that's openly, uh, I'm not talking about the Dajjal now, I'm talking about things that people that openly, Muslims that openly promote that the Prophet had uh, sexual, like, obviously sexual relationship with a child, then they'll openly say, that uh you know that they openly teach this muslims that openly teach this i don't mean people like the common people who don't know but muslims that are activists that are going about openly teaching stuff like this uh, they have betrayed allah and his messenger and it honestly and they, they've either got some warped understanding of islam uh, but the, i i find it difficult to believe that they are genuine in their love for allah and, and his messenger i find that difficult to believe that anybody that says that, that openly teaches things like that, and their justification that people in the past said it, but people in the past are dead. They, you can't call them to change their position. But you are alive. <laughs> 
So no point saying, you know, but so-and-so who died 500 years ago, but he's dead. So it doesn't matter now. But you are still alive. How on earth are you saying this nonsense? So this is the kind of, um, yeah, so these things really, really work me, rile me. <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> I want to get worked up sometimes. This is the kind of thing. So anyway, right, let's move on to some of these questions, people. What's going on? What's going on? What questions have we got trickling in? Right, the Sunni defense. I'm going to come to that. I've got that here. So let's take a few questions because I've not taken any questions. And people are going to think, what the hell? <laughs> we posted questions on his status. And... Por qué? Por qué? Why has he not responded to any of them? So let's see, people. Let's see. Yes, salam. All right. How should we discard papers that have Allah's name or other venerated words on, in Arabic on them? You can burn them if you like. You can incinerate them. So if you have old mushafs, uh, Quran, stuff like this, old copies of the Quran or uh, that's become and you need to kind of uh, safely do away with them, you can uh, incinerate them. Or if you have words that are like Allah's name and stuff like that. Oh, I believe in this day and age you can shred them. If they become totally like by shredding them, they become completely imperceptible. Not like di there's different types of shredders. So obviously some just kind of leave it uh, so you can still kind of make out words or letters and some completely obliterate everything. So if you can completely obliterate it, Alhamdulillah, that's fine. Um, is it necessary to pay zakat whilst living in the UK, especially considering that the high tax rate and the fact that our taxes in a way go towards social programs? <laughs> uh, if you do advise to continue paying zakat, do we have to pay on savings? Or You see, zakat is not really for kind of current accounts. It's more to do with savings. You see, the issue is this, people. We haven't truly kind of caught up in our fiqh. So in the past, zakat was really to do with stuff like um, livestock. It was to do with produce from farming, etc. Uh, these were the real things zakat was all to do with. Uh, it wasn't really to do with gold, silver and stuff like this. It wasn't really because... Gold and silver weren't really people's kind of wealth. The common people, their wealth in abundance wasn't like gold and silver. That was their kind of day-to-day -day earnings by them trading other stock that they had. So zakat really came to deal with these kind of things. In fact, we don't even have a sahih hadith speaking about how much zakat we should give from gold. We don't actually have anything that's sahih. Right, so, oh, this is great. Somebody just trying to, who the hell is trying to call me? Right, so, we don't really have anything sahih. There's some hadith about silver and stuff like this. And then there's a lot of analogy. And this weak hadith, which the scholars have just accepted because they needed something for gold. And they kind of just set the standard. And then everybody accepted it. And, and I'm fine with that. I don't have a problem because I understand they just needed rules and law and order and stuff like this. But the reality is there's really no sahih hadith about how much gold you should have. And, and then you start giving zakat and stuff like this. So I think zakat really got formulated um, in... It's interesting because... Zakat definitely, obviously, is there in the time of the Prophet. No doubt about that. Does it get more... Does, does the structure of Zakat become kind of more... What's the word? Very kind of mechanical after the Prophet. And I suppose I would argue that it probably does. That it's probably after the Prophet that Zakat becomes a bit more mechanical and very kind of, 
it, it takes a lot of detail that perhaps um, that didn't exist before in that sense um, so this is uh, hence a lot of this confusion where can we give zakat where can't we give zakat stuff like this emerges over the ages uh, of you know as generations kind of pass and different rulings but zakat right really is uh whoa somebody just who is this sorry people some person is just anyway right so right so the so that's so, so today how do we deal with zakat today you can just give uh, you can have a savings account the, the way I, I, I would rule is how people like Ibn Ashur, the great Maliki legend, and these people said it, is a bit like the Hanafi method, as in once you have a lump sum that exceeds the nisab, the kind of threshold, then provided that minimum threshold lasts right throughout the year, then you can just pinpoint a month in the year that is your end of, you know, whatever, that's the end when you want to give zakat. And provided there's been a threshold right throughout, whatever you have at the end, you give 2.5. Right, I'm going at this again, people. I don't know what happened then. Right guys, I'm just, I don't know what happened there, I'm just gonna, mm -hmm. just one moment folks, no idea, is this live now, let me see. Just trying to share it. Uh, yeah, on. <laughs> Nazar. You see, that's actually a good, uh, there it is. Right, m a lot of my mates have actually said, that's a good point. They've said that I think I'm living proof that the evil eye doesn't exist. <laughs> because if it did, if it did exist, I think I would definitely have been afflicted. <laughs> uh... Right, so... All right, cool. Evil eye, yep. Let's get things moving. Right, what are the questions, folks? What's going on? What's going on? The devil did that hell no. You see, in my life, these things like sorcery, wizardry, superstition, they play very... <laughs> these things don't really exist in my kind of uh, worldview. So what's going on, folks? Let's take some questions. Uh, Salam, could you explain the allegations against Quran compilation during Uthman? Answered me. I don't know what that means. How do you know which hadith we can accept or not? Uh, right, okay, that's a very good question. The hadith people, you see, when we have a hadith, there's a few things. We need to see, does it clash with reason? The three principles, yeah? Does it clash with reason? Does it go against the established sources like the, the Quran? Does it go against the established Sunnah? Three, does, uh, right, does, does it uproot an Islamic principle? Provided it doesn't, there's no problem here, the chain is fine, then we can go with it. Alhamdulillah. What's that about Dawah man and the, right, okay, yeah, I did see this clip. 
<laughs> ya, ya salam people ya salam so i saw this somebody sent me this clip about uh there's three kind of preachers it was actually shared by the atheist republic on facebook and they were saying they were obviously they were having a field day <laughs> so it said like this these guys they were talking in this clip in this brief clip about youtube uh, hijabi youtubers so hijabi youtubers yeah and they were saying that this is sick like how can how can man and mans let their women <laughs> how can these women be youtubing these hijabi women that they are you know men are going all astray and uh and then so in between, right, it's past the watershed people. So I'm just quoting what they're saying, right? So uh, in between, he says, uh, I know somebody personally. He says, I know somebody who said that he'd masturbated over a YouTube, a hijabi YouTuber. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what's more problematic is that. Okay, that or the fact that you know them. <laughs> I mean, who are these kind of people that you know? What the hell is wrong with <laughs> Like this, you're in a day and age where, <laughs> where the internet is widely available and, and these kind of friends of you, and, you, and these are all like grown men. <laughs> They're not like some kind, of, some kind of uncontrollable kids that are like, kind of like, I don't know. These are like grown up men and he, and he's saying, yeah, I, you know, I've known somebody personally who's done this. <laughs> Can you think, well, what the hell? That was, that would have been one awkward conversation. It's like, or, or bro, what have you been up to? Well, you know, funny you should say that. Well, I got kind of carried away this afternoon. <laughs> yep. Uh, what do you mean? Well, you see, well, I was on YouTube. <laughs> and I kind of saw this hijab. <laughs> hijab? <laughs> right, so <laughs> this is the... I mean, what is wrong with these kind of people? <laughs> Seriously. And don't these, these guys re realize that this... Them discussing this is making a further mockery <laughs> of this dean. I, I honestly don't get it. And the funny thing is that during their discussion, it's only a few minutes. By the way, the comments were awesome. <laughs> the comments that <laughs> the atheists had going on there. Oh my God. <laughs> I think I almost had a heart attack laughing. <laughs> I just got I found them so hilarious. But, uh, <laughs> and they quote this hadith in there. So th during this discussion, these three guys, they say, you know, you don't understand. This is from the ghayrah. This is from the ghayrah, you know, that protective jealousy in Islam. He says, you know, you don't. And there's a hadith of, uh, I believe he, he quotes the one from, is it Sa'd ibn Mu'adh? Or he quotes it from a companion that, uh, that he says that oh about if he f about finding the man with his wife and he would kill him, and the prophet says inna ka rajulun ghayur, uh, that you are a person with ghira but I have more ghira than you and Allah has more ghira than uh, than me and you combined. This hadith, by the way, they're completely quoting this out of context. <laughs> this hadith has got nothing to do with this. This hadith was not about promoting ghira. This hadith was because that guy actually, the discussion was that the Prophet was saying that you need to bring witnesses. You can't throw allegations at women. And this person gets, because some person had claimed that he actually saw somebody with his wife, but he got away. So this is the backdrop to what's going on. And this companion says, you know, if I found somebody, I would just attack them. And the Prophet's condemning him by saying, you can't do that. And even though you might have jealousy, but I'm prohibiting you, but I've got more of this kind of concern, this ghira, for than you have. 
And Allah has more than us, meaning that to safeguard people's lives and their well-being comes first. It's paramount. You can't say, well, even if the Prophet says, even if you found them, you still can't attack them. Now, this is they've completely turned it on its head to say, well, this hadith is about promoting ghira and this kind of what they're translating as protective. Uh, well, <laughs> Right, the, try, Yasser Kasana's comment, I'm not going to read aloud because, <laughs> right, so because the hadith is not talking about ghira like that. So they're translating as protective jealousy. Uh huh. But that's not what, you see, their actions, protective jealousy, this ghira is when you protect their honor, when you protect them when they're defenseless, when you stand up, even if you're fighting for them. It's not about, it doesn't, what they're translating it, not the wording, but they're translating the meaning as insecure paranoia. That's all it is. It's just a, a man who's insecure about his wife. That, oh my God, that, oh my God, why did a guy look at, oh my God, why did you look at her? Why did you ask? Like they give the question that somebody, he says, if somebody said, uh, you know, they ask you. And I accept that, look, cultures vary. In many cultures, people wouldn't ask. <laughs> I accept it would be weird in certain cultures to just say, <laughs> So, bro, <laughs> how's your wife? <laughs> People would find that, because if that's not your general cultural practice, you would find that a bit strange. Uh, I accept that. Or to say, well, so how's your sister? And in many cultures, people we don't do that. And I accept that. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a cultural practice. But he said that, you know, genuinely, somebody asked, he goes, somebody asked me once, oh, how are you doing? How's your wife? How's everything? And he said, I said to him, bro, don't ask about a man's wife. <laughs> I thought, well, if they said it like that, like, how are you doing? How's your wife? How's your family? What the hell? Why are you, get, why are you acting like an insecure, paranoid? Like, that's just weird, man. Like this, you see, this kind of stuff is not Islamic at all. That's just to coat over your insecurity by using this hadith, which has got nothing to do with that. Right, so... Right, what is the... Uh, <laughs> right, what are, we, what are we looking at? What are, what are some questions? What's going on? All right, so we've had this... People have asked me to respond. There's been another video. <laughs> ah, these videos, huh? There's been another... <laughs> She's a lovely reaver. Sorry, I mean... What? what? Uh, I don't know what the con. I'm not going to read that aloud. <laughs> right. So. Right. So, <clears throat> there's been another video, as there always are, uh, against me. You know, it's always fun and games. So. The the video. Let me just deal with this for a moment, then I'll come back to some of the questions. Video was by our lovely, our lovely Wahhabi events. You know the Wahhabi. <laughs> <laughs> Sunni defense. They've done another video. Koi rabta nahi masood mushtaq. Rabta hai, rabta hai, yaar. <laughs> right? There's, so, there's been a video by uh, Sunni, uh, I say Sunni loosely. Uh, <laughs> Wahhabi Sunni defense. Where, <clears throat> so, He's saying that, oh, I haven't answered this question. He's highlighted in this video saying, look, in my video about the video declaring marital rape haram, in that video, he says, I've quoted something uh, amongst the many quotes. I'm going to come to this. He says that these quotes were from some forum and they were misrepresented. So they're not actually accurate. OK, so. Right. Well, my brother, let's let's take a look at what is going on this way. <laughs> this por poraki poraki. So, just to summarize, there's a video. Uh, you can check my video. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's it's to do. It's called um, that rape marital rape is haram in Islam or really. Um, I mean, if you type that in, marital rape, haram, it should come up. But under there, I explain, I mean, in the video, I explain how rape is categorically haram. 
including using religion to justify the rape. So if a person is uh, emotionally blackmailing or religiously blackmailing uh, a woman to rape her, that is still rape. So I've explained that that is categorically haram. So a husband, just as like, let's say a husband is going to beat up his wife and like beat her up if she says no to sex. That is clearly rape. Now, if he's going to say, oh, I'm not going to beat you up, but Allah is going to punish you after you die. You see, that is no less rape. <laughs> there is, that's just like saying, in other words, a deferred beating. So that's just threatening her still, because it's still a threat, but it's a threat with a deferred punishment. So it's still haram, categorically. Now... Right, so first of all, this, this there is a hadith, and I've done a whole, so what I would advise is people, when they get a moment, please go check out my video, because it's over half an hour, I do a complete breakdown of how that is coercion, that is haram, and no, the hadith is not true, and to say that the Lord is angry because you ain't, ain't getting sex is ridiculous. <laughs> You seriously overestimate, <laughs> talk about self-aggrandizement, like that you, I don't know, I don't know, is, is, is that a metaphor for like the Lord down there? Because is that what you, you mean, that the Lord is angry? <laughs> Lord is angry. <laughs> is this like some kind of like a, a nickname that you, you've got going on? Because there's no way on earth that God is going to be angry about you not having sex. Okay, I'm just being real with you, right? So you've seriously got an ego issue going on because that is not true <laughs> by any measure, no matter how much you think about yourself. So right now, there's this hadith which is weak. Uh, I believe it's unacceptable, utterly. It clashes with the Quran. It clashes with the authentic sunnah. clashes with the principles of Islam. Uh, and the hadith is, إِذَا بَاتَتِ الْمَرْعَى هَاجِرَةَ فِرَاشِ زَوْجِهَا that if a woman stays away, abandons, like she stays away from the bed, uh, the angels will curse her. In another hadith, that the Lord is angry with her. Uh, either until morning or until she comes back. <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> Which Lord? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Lord. Lord is angry, <laughs> this is, right? So <laughs> this is a, a new, <laughs> you know, some Lord can be used for many things. Like it can be used for, like a woman at home can be called Rabbatul Bayt, the Lord, Lordess <laughs> of, of the house. And so he could be using this as a metaphor, right? So now I went through this hadith and I showed, and I won't go through the whole uh, breakdown again, but I demonstrated how this hadith is not reliable. I read out the wordings of the hadith. I quoted it from, it is in Bukhari, it is in Muslim, it is in Abu Dawood, it is in uh, Darmi, it is in uh, Musnad of Ahmad. It is in all of these narrations. I showed the several prob uh, the problems with these chains. Uh, I showed that how these chains mainly rely on, they seem to come down mainly relying upon two kind of tabi'een, you've got al-a'mash, and uh, it also relies on qatada as well. And the hadith is transmitted predominantly through Abu Huraira radiallahu an. Uh, but these two people are mudallisin, uh, that's people who kind of omit other weak, some, they omit people in the chain. So if they say an, which means from, without saying I heard from, they just say so and so said, they don't say he said it to me or I heard him say if they speak like that, like vague, an is a vague term. If they use vague terms, then their hadith becomes problematic. So I mentioned that. I also mentioned how this clashes with the verse of the Quran that Ashiruhunna bil ma'roof, that you have to treat women uh, with kindness, that Allah says you're either with them or you separate gracefully. How the Prophet ﷺ always taught kindness. I showed that how. So all of these these narratives, how there is no coercion in Islam, all of these kind of things I went through. Now, okay, 
our Wabi brothers, right? So he's pointed out. First of all, I I'd like to highlight our uh, Sunni defense brothers. They pointed out that during all of this, this uh, during my uh, analysis and evaluation of this hadith, I highlighted three names, um, which he says, which were from I obtained from a forum that misrepresented the quotes and therefore they're inaccurate. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I want to say, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you, shukran, shukran, for highlighting that. Muchas gracias, mi hermano el Wahhabi. I, I, first of all, no, we should be grateful when people point things out, alhamdulillah. Man lam yashkurin nas, lam yashkurillah. Whoever does not, is not grateful to people, is not grateful to Allah, to the Lord, right? So uh, then I want to highlight that, look, the, these these quotes or these names, I mentioned with them what they'd said. Okay, I then immediately, if you watch my clip, which they quite conveniently stopped at that point, if you watch my clip, I go on. I don't stop there. I carry on. Uh, these clips, I pe uh, what, sorry, these quotations, I do not take as my judgment. I do not take as my judgment. So one of the, these quotations come down to two things. One, that this person, Al-A'mash, al is a kathab, is a liar. Two, he's mutaham fi dinihi, right? That he's somebody whose deen is problematic. Now, I go on to say immediately after that why Al-A'mash is problematic. I do not say because he's a liar. I do not say because his deen is a problem. I say al Atmash is problematic because he's a mudallis and there is an'ana in this chain. So you can watch what I say. I immediately after that go on to say this. So as far as these quotes being in a forum, let's say misrepresented, shukran, shukran, okay, they're misrepresented. I appreciate that you've highlighted that. So his conclusion, by the way, his conclusion was, because these, let's say, these three quotes, uh, these three names, and this quote coming down to him being a liar, or him being accused that his deen was problematic, his religion was problematic, that these things are from a forum which is misrepresented. Therefore, Abu Laith, <laughs> by the way, I love the way, they all say Laith. <laughs> Abu Laith. <laughs> Abu Laith is one of two. He's either... <laughs> He's either a Dajjal, <laughs> he's either an antichrist, or he's just an utter Jahil, who's absolutely wrong in what he's saying. So, okay, let's go to what I've said. Why don't you, so am I, why don't you highlight very clearly that I'm wrong in saying al Atmash is a Mudallis? I'm wrong. Highlight it, say it, that I'm wrong in saying that Atmash is a Mudallis. Say it, that I'm wrong in the chain, the hadith that I've quoted, the takhrij that it's found in these books, am I wrong? No, they'll say, no, you're absolutely right, it is in those books. Am I wrong in reading the chains that it was Ahmash from Abu Hazim, from Abu Hurairah? Say, no, no, that is right, that is right, Abu Layth. I'd say, am I wrong in mentioning that it comes down primarily to these two Rawis? Say, no, this is not wrong, this one, my brother. Say, Am I wrong in highlighting that Ibn al-Mubarak and his criticism of al-A'mash? Am I wrong in what Ali ibn al-Madini or in Tahdib al-Kamal that the amount of tadlis al-A'mash has done, that he's omitted names, that al-A'i has mentioned that yudallisu an al dhu'afa Ibn Abd al-Bar has mentioned yudallisu an al dhu'afa dhu'afa <laughs> That from weak narrators he would omit them. Am I wrong? Am I wrong, my brother? <laughs> so they say, uh, no. Am I wrong in my conclusion in saying that this hadith has a mudallis and it's an'ana? Am I wrong, brother? Why don't you just openly say it's wrong? But this one, no, no, no. This, this one you cannot do. But they would say, no, you're not wrong. So I say, okay, am I so, so what's the problem, my brother? What's the problem? 
They say the problem is you're a Dajjal. <laughs> the problem is you're a Dajjal. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what, what, what's a comeback to that. <laughs> I'm asking like, right, so am I wrong in every... So is all of this wrong then? Have I lied in all of this? Is this what... You know, what I've based the conclusion on, my own conclusion that he's a mudallis, what these people have said, the, these names, Ibn Abdul Bar, Dhahabi, all these names are quoted saying he's a mudallis, the Ilal of Tirmidhi, all of these things, are these wrong? Say, nah, brother. <laughs> so, so what the problem, brother? <laughs> problem is you're the jal. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, salam. You know, seriously. You see, look, this is the, this is the problem, you know, this is the problem that, you know, whilst Abu Layth, Abu Layth is here highlighting that you ask these people, do you have a problem with rape going on? The marital rape. So they don't seem to have a problem with that. Okay. Our Bahraini Gulf Arab brothers, you know, the Arab brothers, you know, this not all this particular brother right so they don't seem to have a problem with the rape they don't seem to have a problem with such nonsense being attributed to the prophet they don't seem to have a problem with this going against the verse of the quran about coercion and all of these things they have no problem whatsoever they don't seem to attack what i've highlighted as the actual criticism the actual conclusion of what i've said attack that oh you by the way, in between you said these names, uh, but these names were misrepresented on a forum. Okay, did, did I rely on those names? Did I rely on those things? Did I go with what? Did I call A'mash a kathab? Did I say his religion was a problem? Did I say these? Did I go with that as the reason to debunk this hadith? No, brother. <laughs> I said he was a mudallis. But it's too... <laughs> it's, but you must either be a Dajjal or either be a Jahil. So this, this is the problem. This is what we're dealing with. So I've been asked to comment again. I've commented now. Look, if you would like to show that this chain is absolutely authentic, then do so. Show it to me. Show me an unquestionably uncritical chain. Allowing this kind of nonsense of marital rape. Show me, and I will then take it to task. But this is, the, you know, they just, oh, we've asked, this is the BS, the BS of Abu Layth, the BS. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is where the research is one thing, and the result is another. <laughs> in, fact, in fact, there's a story I remember. Somebody told me, you know, like a subcontinental scholar from the, <laughs> the subcontinent. He said once there was an, a, somebody doing some research. So he was researching flies. <laughs> and he was trying to show the contrast between sometimes research, the investigation, and the result. <laughs> so he had this fly. And he was, and what he would do is he would pull... Like he'd obviously trap this fly, fly around, he'd check it out, investigate it. Then he'd pluck one of the wings. And then he'd say, Uro, Uro, like he'd tell you to fly, fly, fly. So that so it only have one wing, so it kind of flap around, like kind of like all bent and everywhere. <laughs> and then what he did is he plucked both wings. And the fly would just stay there and he'd say, Uro, fly, fly. And the fly wouldn't fly. So he said, ah, so his result was the conclusion. So that was the investigation. The result was, he said, Ek par iska, if you pull out one wing, this fly, makhi teri ho jati hai. You know, it, it flies bent. But if you pull out two wings, you pluck two wings, ye makhi beri ho jati hai. <laughs> the fly becomes deaf. <laughs> So that's, that's that's where you have a huge difference between an investigation and the result. So he's assuming that the fly is now deaf. <laughs> so this is the thing. 
So because that he's saying that this was misrepresented on a particular forum, so now Abu Layth must be an antichrist. He must be a Dajjal. <laughs> That's the natural conclusion that just follows on. <laughs> the natural conclusion isn't that, yes, all these hadith and let's deal with the Tadlis and let's bring a a chain that's unquestionably uncritical the natural conclusion is okay because that forum had this or whatever this is misrepresented these names which you didn't rely on by the way but still <laughs> the natural conclusion is you you must be an antichrist ah <laughs> oh, gotta love them Mwah. <laughs> oh geo 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 i gotta do it you know the pakistani style they go Haters, huh? Haters, I tell you. Haters. Yeah, this, you gotta, <laughs> see, they have this, oh, this drive to them. You gotta be grateful for your haters as well, to be fair. You gotta be grateful. Because, to be honest with you, it's like somebody said the other day about a hater. And I said, look, I said, let's be honest. I said to the guy, if you were anything like that person, <laughs> Astaghfirullah <laughs> I'm not saying it People were saying it you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying he was ugly People are saying it Zalim <laughs> dunya But if you were anything like these people Like I'm just saying A particular this person we were discussing the other day Who was kind of hating I said let's just face it Let's be honest If you were like that Let's just use the term Mahroom Deprived <laughs> You too would hate the world. <laughs> so you have to, you have to have this. You have to give your sympathy to these haters. You have to say, haters, Allah ni marzi. Right, let's move on, people. Let's take some questions. Let's take some questions. Right, let's take some questions. So I hope that answers. So I await. Look, I hope that answers that question to do with this. Uh, as to him saying those names were, uh, you know, that's not accurate. First of all, shukran. Bod bod danyawad. Bod bod danyawad. Okay. <laughs> right. I appreciate you highlighting that. Much appreciated. Uh, those names won't be, uh, you know, at least it's good to know. But I never relied on them anyway. And why don't you actually criticize what I did rely on and show me a clear chain that justifies uh, your uh, ridiculous assertion that uh, rape is permi permitted, which is an obnoxious, atrocious statement. Anyway, let's move on. Right, can you do... This is Mariam. Thank you again for my shahada. All right, Mariam. You're doing it, doing it. Bienvenidos, bienvenidos. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome, welcome. And it's, it's an absolute honor, absolute honor. Can you do wudu with hair gel? Of course you can. Of course you can. Just wipe over, people. Wipe over. Can we apply cream that contains alcohol and pray? Uh, yes, of course. By the way, that... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My mind, by the way, is always on, on humor mode, so I have to be careful. Right, but uh, yes, you can apply cream that has alcohol. It's absolutely fine. Okay, and that alcohol isn't that same kind of drinking alcohol. Hair colouring, is it okay? Hell yeah, hair colouring is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. Nola Borges is fake laugh. Fake person. Okay, Nola. <laughs> fake. What are you doing on this fake person's fake live transmission? Adios. Adios, amiga. Adios. Right. View on Shadilia. Who did Abraham alayhi salam take for sacrifice? That's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. Uh, what do you think about Abu Ibrahim's racist remarks? I've answered this in last week's. Or was it the week before? Week before. So you can check that then. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, ah. Uh, uh. Sobriety is overrated, people. <laughs> that reminds
reminds me of a poem. <laughs> All right, poem time. Poem. It reminds me of a poem. Teri must nigahi ka baram raklunga. That he says that your that because your eyes are so known for their intoxication that I will keep their reputation. Okay. Teri must nigahi ka baram raklunga. Hosh aya bi to keh dunga muje hosh nahi. That even if I do become sober, I'll say I'm not sober. <laughs> Just to keep that reputation of those intoxicating eyes. No coke. Mm, there's a bit mixed in there. Right, so. Right, what are we looking at, people? What are we looking at? Let's take some rapid round kind of questions. What was your... Somebody said you missed my question. What was your question? Right. ¿Cuál es tu pregunta? ¿Cuál es tu pregunta, mi amigo? What is your question? What is your question? <laughs> you keep saying you missed my... Tell me the question. I don't know what the question... Uh, interest taking or giving in countries like India... Watch my clip, it's on YouTube, about uh, uh, about things like uh, interest and riba. I've answered how I don't believe uh, these things to necessarily be haram in the current system because I don't believe that it was that the maqasid were not aimed at this system. So you have to watch that whole, it's, over, it's about 40 minutes long. It's a whole explanation. What are your views on the Shadiliyah? Uh, Shadaliyah are a Sufi group, a Sufi order. I'm not really part of any Sufi orders, as you can see. I'm just a, a wanderer in my own right, that's all. I'm not really part of... Uh, people who want to be part of Sufi orders, I don't, you know, I don't condemn them. I don't... To me, though, I kind of see all of this more as folklore religion. I see this as kind of a need that common people kind of have to... To make sense of religion and stuff like this and I, it's not really authentic from the quran or sunnah but uh you know chalo chalta hai yaar. <laughs> no i de care don't worry about it it's all good it's all good what are your views on sudais yeah i did share that video of some person criticizing sudais uh you see the thing is that these people have for too long kind of preached their ways it's not Look, I don't have an, some kind of hatred against Sheikh Sudais. I don't, right? I love his recitation. I totally love his style. But, you know, these sermons, these things, referring constantly to Jews and Christians as, uh, you know, like Al-Khanazir and Qarada and, you know, monkeys and pigs and all this kind of stuff. It, it's for years they've instilled the hatred for people in the hearts of Muslims. And even now, look what they're doing, all these kind of things, bombing Yemen, and their support for this kind of stuff. Uh, it's, it's atrocious. Uh, so, yes, I was glad to hear that how somebody had confronted him. Right, so, you guys should follow the Ahlu Bayt Tariqah. I'm not really interested in any Sufi orders, to be honest with you. <laughs> To me, it's more about reason, okay? And through that, I find my spiritual consciousness, if you like, okay? So, was Prophet Adam the first person on earth? What does person mean? Like, hominin? Of course not. He wasn't the first hominin, but he is the father of humanity as we know it today, okay? he, All of humanity, Adam a.s. is the father of humanity, but were there hominins before Adam of course they were I mean that's my understanding that they would have been you know all the other whether it's going to be homo erectus homo you know homo all of these not not homo in that sense <laughs> Heidelbergensis homo africanus homo all these kind of different uh ones you're going to get uh I believe homo agasta homo habilis all of these neanderthal um even old Homo sapiens, but pre-cognitive revolution, I believe that they, uh, 
now they were there but adam alayhi salam was the first with the cognitive kind of revolution are dinosaurs mentioned in the quran <laughs> What is Allah going to say to people about like, you know, but he's going to mention like T-Rex and things like this in the Quran. <laughs> what the hell? You know, what, what, what on earth is all of that about? Like, obviously, these things are not mentioned in the Quran, but they don't need to be mentioned in the Quran. Why did Uthman burn the Quran? Uh, he, he, he never, you see, that sounds very hostile when you say it like that. He asked, he synchronized the script of the Quran and then he said in order not to have anything that strays from this let's uh, safely dispose of any other copies so we have these and then he made several some say seven or other copies he sent them to the main capital kind of cities and had them kind of print them up like as in not print but write from them so that's but when you say like why did Uthman burn the Quran it sounds very hostile he never burnt the Quran like hey where's the Quran let me set it on fire uh, he, that's how did he dispose of copies that they felt contained maybe inaccuracies that was the question Nola is back saying orange juice <laughs> muchas gracias Nola muchas gracias so what's going down, people? What's going down? Right, so how do we, I don't know. what. Let's take some rapid round questions and we'll wrap this up, people. We'll wrap this up. Oh, somebody asked about Noman Ali Khan. I shared a clip of Noman Ali Khan, Ustad Noman Ali Khan. It was an excellent clip, really. I totally loved it, I'm going to be honest. Um, it's probably, I think it's about five minutes long. It's an interview in Urdu. Now, he's asked, the question that what does Allah want from us and he says he begins by saying you know had of you asked me this a decade earlier my response would have been entirely different that my response then would have been very guilt laden all doom and gloom all kind of that Allah wants us to worship and this and you know he wants to burden us with this responsibility and we and we're never going to really everybody's going to burn in the akhirah and it's a very kind of doom we're guilty and we're full of sin and we're going to suffer and everybody's going to suffer you know this kind of very he said I had this kind of image and he said well now 10 years later how he'd kind of moved on and how the Quran he saw in it messages of just hope and how Allah is saying how he's built paradise not just for Muslims but for insan for humanity how this whole this is a caravan of hope basically and the message is one of compassion and hope and so I found it really amazing I mean I, if you do understand Urdu do have a watch of it it's not uh Right, how are punishments from Sharia decided? You see, my understanding is the Sharia religion, uh, sorry, the laws was simply a social remedy based on the social understandings available. So Islam never introduced any kind of punishment or any kind of things like that that were completely alien to the culture that they came to. Rather, it just placed parameters on the kind of punishments and sanctions that those people already had so the arabs already had things like stoning and stuff like or the jewish that came from the jewish thing but the arabs it was not completely unfamiliar to them okay so these kind of things it just placed parameters uh, like they would already cut limbs and stuff like this so it came uh, with just just with their whatever practices were but it just placed some parameters and with time, as I believe, with time, and as Abul Qasim al burzuli and many other Maliki scholars said, with time, as the punishments of civilizations change, so should the Sharia and the laws. Uh, so that's, uh, I've got a video on that, on trajectory hermeneutics. You can check it out on YouTube, okay. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, mentioning the word stoning, <laughs> reminds me of two things. One, there's a... Uh, so would I believe for fornication there would be stoning or lashing? 
<laughs> Hell no. <laughs> I don't believe that at all uh, in 2018. Of course not. He, 600 years ago, Abu Qasim al-Burzili said there wouldn't be that in his time. That's 600 years ago. What about in our time, in post-modernity? You wouldn't obviously do things like that because that would make the religion become tarnished. Um, so, And we've got to really question a lot of things as well. There's, there's too much work to be done, to be honest. Um, it's really difficult. So uh, there's a lot that even concepts need to be questioned. For example, even relationships. And you've got to understand something as well. Even zina and all of these things need to be kind of looked at. And what is it? What were marriages? So Aisha radiallahu anha says in a hadith that there were marriages were of, for example, there were four different types and, and these became obsolete. And the only thing that remained halal was the relationship that the, the kind of marriage structure that people have today that was in her day and age meaning the kind of nikah that the that that was there so what's interesting is how are relationships then perceived over the ages and how does 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 ijtihad have to take them into consideration because one would believe that it ought to so where does that kind of leave a lot of things and it's interesting it's interesting i'm just saying that people uh, so there's a lot of work, basically, a lot of kind of ijtihad has to go into things, a lot of evaluation. I think today people, uh, there's a lot of emotions when it comes to certain things, but there isn't, they're not really thinking about what Islam actually says. They're just being emotional and it's a lot of culture. That's what there is. But yeah, so, right, coming back to stoning, I was going to say there's two things that come to my mind. One, there's a hadith in Sahil Bukhari, once again, another uh, fabricated, uh, misrepresented hadith about a companion saying, oh, I saw monkeys fornicate and one of them fornicated and then the monkeys got together and stoned that monkey. <laughs> I mean, that is, you got to be joking, right? Th these kind of things are like animals don't do something like it, like whether animals were pelting each other or not is not an act of stoning okay because they were fornicating like that it doesn't the animal kingdom doesn't work like that okay it doesn't work like i mean yes they will attack each other they will pelt each other they will, but it doesn't work with these kind of imaginative realities like fornication fornication is an imaginative reality in the sense of as is marriage it's marriage is part of the imaginative realm it's not actually it doesn't actually exist i mean it's something that's in our minds it's an institution that we have built up as part of the imaginative realm. Religion has recognized it for its kind of uh, purposive function in society. But to assume animals think like that and they have constructs like fornication, marriage, stuff like this is absurd, right? So these kind of things, uh, you see, it's, once again, it ridicules religion, right? Animals, monkeys, they realized one monkey had fornicated, so they got together and they, <laughs> they stoned the monkey to death. Like, what, what on earth are you talking about? Like, yes, I'm not saying monkeys may pelt each other with stones. They may even kill each other. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but it's not based on these concepts. Okay, it's not like a conceptual like thing going on. Like, hey, do you know that monkey has violated the social norm of relationships. Therefore, uh, we need to sanction that monkey under code so and so which divine justice of let's stone that monkey to death <laughs> that is absurd i mean what the <laughs> what the hell let's <laughs> talk about i see that that's another example so anyway that came to my mind so that's in that's a hadith in sahil bukhari which obviously is false <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying, you see, the whole, I'm not saying that whether somebody saw monkeys throwing stones at each other has to be false. That obviously would happen all the time. Monkeys would pelt each other. But all this narrative is nothing but creative writing. Like monkeys don't, animals don't have these constructs like this, okay? They don't think like that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but this is exactly why we need to find calm religion from these cobwebs because Allah and his messenger are free from this kind of stuff the other thing I want to say about stoning was uh, 
You know, people have asked me uh, about this verse, in, and I've seen some ex-Muslims and atheists also refute Muslims on this verse of the Quran that وَلَقَدْ زَيِّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا وَجَعَلْنَاهَا مصابيح, that how the sky has been kind of lit up with lamps, as lamps, with kind of, with the stars and stuff like this. وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رَجُومًا لِلشَّيَاطِينَ and we have, and this is interesting, we have made them, now they, some people have translated this, they've translated this as rujuman, that they fire at the shayateen as they go up, devils, as they try to permeate through these heavens, they get hit at with comets and things like this. That's not what this verse of the Quran is saying. Okay, that is not what this verse of the Quran is saying. Okay, rajam, yes, can mean stoning, but Rajam here, as you'll see certain Mufassireen, I believe amongst them, I believe Ibn Ashur mentions it, other people have mentioned it as well, it's not just him. If you read through diverse uh, tafasir, Rajam also means a guess. Like, you know, when you guess something, it's like, a, like people will say a shot in the dark, like you take a wild guess. A wild guess was also referred to as a Rajam because it was just a throw. Like they say in, in Urdu as well, Pankarai. <laughs> Penku, <laughs> maybe penku or yebi penku. <laughs> so this thing of like just throwing of just it's just a like what a random shot is rajam. It's a guess. So as the poet said in the Jahiliya poetry when he says that it's that this is truth what we tell you. Wama huwa anha bil hadith al murajami, and it is not. We're not just. This isn't just guesswork. We're not just chatting it. In other words, this is. What we are telling you is factual. So here Allah says that this sky that you see as lamps. And people say, well, you know, the stars ain't in the sky. But Allah is addressing the people as they see it from their perspective. Now people see these things as like these kind of majestic lamps that have kind of decorated the sky with all this glory. And yet, and Allah Allow, if people want, he allows them. That lishayatin, the people who are astray, the devils, and this shayatin al ins from insan, the shayatin, we have shayatin amongst us, they use this as guesswork to predict the future. Rujuman lishayatin. That these shayatin, they look at these stars. And through their kind of astronomy, uh, through astrology and things like this, they try to predict future and luck and stuff like this. That that's what they are. That is what this verse of the Quran means. It doesn't mean, oh, the jinn go up and comets kind of strike at them and stuff like that. It doesn't mean that at all. So yes, we have to be careful in our tafasir because if we don't, people will... They, they will obviously use that as an opportunity to ridicule uh, Allah, His Messenger, this religion. And we have a responsibility uh, in transmitting things as they are, as they make sense. Right, so inshallah, I hope that's of some insight. People, can women vote about having Sharia law? Hell yeah, Nola, go for it. <laughs> of course. Women can vote. What does that mean? Of course I believe women can vote. Right. Did God speak to Moses? And how did he speak? How did he speak to Moses? We don't know about these things. Uh, what about Gog Magog? You see, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman al-Sa'adi, the Salafi Sheikh, has a very interesting risala. Fi Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. You should read it. It's available. It's online. Uh, Ibn Ashur and other people as well, they all speak about Ya'juj and Ma'juj are not these kind of monsters and these kind of little goblins and people that they, that people think they are. In the Risala uh, of Sheikh Sa'di and other people, they've highlighted that these are most likely because from the word Ya'uju, Ta'uj, like something that suddenly rises and suddenly kind of with, with it brings uh, a kind of unsettling uh, turmoil that they felt that these were, I mean, people have interpreted differently, but Sheikh Sa'adi felt that that was the kind of colonial period. Ya'juj and Ma'juj. 
and why that was so why that was so significant because after it the world was never the same again everything changed from the concept of the world to the economy to currency to nation states to how everything changed and and that's he has a risale. It's available online. I find it very interesting. Cool. Uh, can you lead prayers with tiyamum? Of course, you can lead prayers with tiyamum. As Imam Malik says in the Muatta, that the person with tiyam uh, with wudu is not more pure than a person who has tiyamum. Right, guys. I hope that's of some help. I'll leave you guys to it. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, subscribe to it, people. Subscribe, subscribe to it, people. Uh, subscribe to it, yeah, my Facebook page, both of them, like it, share it, right? Spread the love, people, spread the love. If you want to reach out to me, you can send me a message. I do try to respond as much as I can. Uh, that's on Facebook Messenger or, uh, or on Facebook. I am on Twitter, although I, <laughs> I need to use it. Uh, Snapchat, Malm2014, M-A-L-M-2014, Instagram, Mufti Abu Layth. Other than that, people, take very good care of yourselves. As always, you're absolutely awesome. S keep laughing. Stay blessed, people. Inshallah. Enjoy the mercy and the blessings of Allah. And you see, this is how this is this is how you should be positive. This is what I'm talking about. Not like these kind of angry faces going on. <laughs> right? So other than that, take very good care of yourselves, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.